Born into a turbulent era of Jim Crow laws and segregation in early 20th century America, Mary Lou Williams navigated the complexities of her experiences as an African-American woman in music to leave an indelible mark on the landscape of jazz in the 1900s through her performance, compositions, arrangements, and pedagogy. A jazz pianist, composer, and arranger, Williams was born on May 8, 1910 in Atlanta, Georgia, and forged a career path which spanned every stylistic period in the field of jazz. As a performer and arranger, she is known for her arrangements and role as jazz pianist with the Andy Kirk Band and for her work with trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie. As a composer, she created tunes as well as religious compositions which followed a conversion to Catholicism. She was also the first artist in residence at Duke University for four years, leading up to her death in 1981. While she received acclaim toward the end of her life, it is difficult to quantify the monumental challenges she faced as an African-American woman in the age of segregation and the civil rights movement. Yet despite these obstacles, Williams' dedication to music undoubtedly paved a way for women in jazz today. Around the late 1930s, her time with the Indy Kirk Band brought her arrangements to the public eye and was extremely beneficial to her career path. Rollum is one of the most notable of these arrangements. It was written for clarinetist Benny Goodman, who had asked Williams to be his full-time arranger and pianist, an offer which she declined. However, her arrangements continued to gain popularity, especially among band leaders such as Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, and Earl Hines. Another one of Mary Lou Williams's notable compositions is her Zodiac Suite, the first large-scale work that she wrote. Each movement is based on a jazz musician with one of the 12 Zodiac signs. This was originally recorded with piano, bass, and percussion, but was later adapted for chamber orchestra and jazz band. The Zodiac Suite was performed at Carnegie Hall in 1946, a year after its first premiere. During this time, she also began hosting the Mary Lou Williams Piano Workshop radio show. Yet, it was during these creative endeavors of the late 1940s that Williams began to closely examine herself and her musical livelihood. The season that followed was one of deep introspection and soul-searching that had been slowly welling up during the first half of her career. In the 1950s, Mary Lou Williams embarked on a tour of Europe. It is during this period that her thoughts and reflections accumulated in a hiatus from performing altogether. In 1957, she notoriously walked off the stage of a Paris nightclub and left the jazz scene for three years. In the context of discrimination, oppression, and hardships she faced throughout her career, this action is readily understandable. Through my work as an archivist, I want to amplify the voices of those who have been silenced by society, the patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera. So at the Institute, one of the collecting areas that we wanna bo you know, bolster and, and keep growing is uh, women jazz musicians and women in jazz as musicians, as promoters, as venue owners, as critics, as journalists, because as you are well aware, uh, women's roles in jazz are not recognized or acknowledged as much as men's. And that's still the case. And, and that, um, that inequality, you know, shows, rears up its ugly head in, in many, 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 many different ways, even today. Um, uh, but in, for example, in the case of Mary Lou Williams, which is what I was got into, got getting to, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Penny Vonessian. She's a historian and she wrote a book that's called Satchmo Blows Up the World. And it's about the State Department sponsored tours, um, jazz tours in the 1950s and how the State Department used jazz as a diplomatic tool to aid in the Cold War. Um, pursuit against communism. So, um, and world domination, but you know, <laughs> all of that. But um, there's a point where she, where Boneshin writes about how there's this, um, the State Department formed this committee of, of jazz experts. And and here's just, just to kind of highlight the type of world we, we live in they assemble this committee of jazz experts who are a not jazz musicians but all white old men so there we go um larshall stearns who was the founder of the institute of jazz study was in this advisory committee so this advisory committee 
their role was to assist the State Department since they had no JS expertise or any sort of idea of who, what, when, where, to assist them in selecting the musicians that will be sent abroad to represent the United States. So, well, A, who's on the committee? All, all white men, non-jazz musicians, no African-Americans and no performing. And if, so there we go, talk about who gets to decide who goes where and what, you know, it's, it's out, outside of, of the field. And, and she writes then for specifically for Mary Lou Williams, she writes that the committee, they wanted, she made like the short list of finalists, like eventually like Dizzy Gillespie and, and Louis Armstrong are, were one of the uh, early um, shows, the early names that were sent abroad to represent the United States. And Mary Lou Williams was in the short list, but the committee deemed her, um, you know, they, they, she had recently had this religious conversion and, and she had stopped playing for a little while and she was like, ah, that, mm -mm. she's like not well mentally. Like it, the assessment of, of her not being quite herself because she was going through a really deep and, and profound personal experience and religious experience Whereas, for example, musicians like Miles Davis, who had other um, periods of, of, of struggle and or I don't want to cast judgment, but you know, they, they all clearly were uh, struggling with something. That's just genius. Just me. So, you know, if it's a man, it's like, oh, it's just it's, he's such a genius that it's just so hard to like carry all that talent. But if it's a woman, oh, she's crazy. So you you see that um, playing out in very, very, very tangible ways, and such like that. Mary Williams did not get to go; did, was not selected as you know America's finest, most shiniest stars to represent uh, the country abroad, and. Who, who got to go, um, Dizzy, Dizzy Gillespie went um, and, and Louis Armstrong. And so how did she go around it? Like there was no go going around that uh, at that time, I, I think. And this is just me um, kind of speculating and or teasing out uh, those threads, which would be a really interesting um, research topic. But um, she did, you know, carry on. She stayed true to her faith and to her calling, and to perform to to um, as performance as worship and musician musicianship as worship, and and that's where she found her steady ground to continue on with her career. She continued to. For, to tour and she eventually, as we saw in that picture, that was in when she was at Duke University as a, as a visiting professor. So, so yes, I mean, like, you know, if we have it hard today, you know, 2020, imagine 1970 something or 1960 something, an African-American woman composer pianist trying to make it in the jazz world. It, it, it's, it's just incredible to me and, and that's why at the Institute, we want to make sure that all these stories and all these voices are preserved and amplified so that we we can stop doing that and making sure that everyone gets the recognition they deserve and, and, the, and the accolades for their artistry. These challenges that Williams faced drastically shaped and redefined her mission. She began dedicating herself to charity work and created the Bel Canto Foundation to assist musicians who suffered from drug addictions. This period in the late 1950s also marked the genesis of her religious compositions and her gradual return to the world of performing. The most famous of these religious works is her jazz mass, Music for Peace. It incorporates elements of swing, blues, gospel, funk, and other genres in an innovative way that brings the mass to life. It was adapted as a ballet by the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater and was eventually performed in Manhattan's St. Patrick's Cathedral in 1975, becoming the first jazz mass to be performed in that space. The Music for Peace, um, it's, it's her, it, it was a large scale work and we put it together and, and even though I'd heard it before and as we were planning this uh, collaboration, 
it was not until I saw the, the you know, I, I listened and sat through the final performance that it really, the, the grandeur and, and her, her creative energy and all the different elements that came into, into the, the music itself was just a really intense emotional experience and and i'm so glad we were able to pull it off you know it was a labor of love and a lot of you know because not only the chorus it also has is jazz trio and chorus so we were i was just so thankful that the director um of the rutgers newark chorus was super excited and and gung-ho about collaborating on, on this program so that was that's, I think, one of my favorite um, Mary Lou Williams um, pieces. And it's interesting to um, another segue, which, you know, may not apply to the specific question that you asked me, but I am thankful that not only do we have things in the archives, but there's a lot of Mary Lou Williams love around the world. So there's a lot of people put a lot of things in YouTube or you can find a lot of things in um, Spotify. So it is possible to branch out and especially during this pandemic and lockdown to really um, kind of get to listen to and engage with her creative um, process and her and her music. The interviewer is asking her why did she stop playing and this is where she got to this juncture in her career and in her personal and spiritual life where she just stopped performing and she's she says, well, I didn't really stop on my own. Something carried me away. I began praying. I never thought about pr playing anymore. I just thought about helping people other than, as I understand and have experienced, that God was helping many souls through music, but I decided to help them in flesh instead of playing for them. I understand that you can offer it up every note you play to help some souls and things like that, but I was going on my own without the talent. The talent was much stranger for, much more stronger for helping people. So like she's really at a incredible juncture in her life. And she also, and aside from that, she also did, uh, you know, aside from all of her music, playing, performing, composing, arranging, this, that, she also had a nonprofit um, organization uh, where she she had like a, a thrift store pretty much, and she helped musicians in need um, with you know grocery money, rent money, pretty much providing those level of support for people in need. And and she relied on donations and assistance from her musician friends. So like she in in this interview a few pages back uh, now that I was reading, uh, preparing for this to, um, she talks about how she worked with Dizzy Gillespie and his wife Lorraine in, and they were instrumental in helping with her um, nonprofit and, and, and keeping it afloat, for example. So, so that's, you know, another interesting piece of her knowing that she um, tapped into those networks that, that she had developed as a musician to um, help her fulfill her spiritual and personal mission, which is pretty cool. Through her music and her actions, Williams's strong conviction to serve God and help others guided her in navigating the many obstacles she faced. As a woman of color, the challenges due to both gender and racial discrimination marked every step of her musical journey. Yet amidst these difficulties, she cultivated a career which changed the landscape of jazz and had an exceptional impact on the next generation of musicians. Speaking about Williams with female jazz musicians of today, her influence as a musical trailblazer both in performance and composition is clear. She's such an important one. I didn't even know who she was until recently, like relatively recently, like much after college and this is a tragedy this is like this makes me enraged because she has a contribution um equal to comparable to not equal nobody's the same but comparable to people like duke ellington and so the fact that she's not 
popularly known in the world in the same way is a crime, I think. Um, when I started to learn about Mary Lou Williams, it really changed how I feel about being a musician. I have felt so many times in my career like quitting and reading her story and the fact that she actually quit jazz at least two times, maybe three on record that we know of, really made me feel like this is a normal feeling to have and when I started to read about the treatment that she received being a Black woman in that time period and a jazz musician to boot, it put things in perspective for me as a white woman in the you know 21st century. My struggles don't even compare to what she went through. Um, having to go on the road and be, you know, treated the way she was. I, I don't want to get too into the details of her story, but finding out about her story was very impactful for me. And it made me feel like, okay, every woman in this field, we share these, we, it, it's like, you know, they talk about um, how DNA transfers transgenerationally. <laughs> um, it makes me think of that because there's something that you inherit when you take on, like jazz is not just a music, it's a life. And so young jazz musicians are taking on that history of the music and the musicians who came before them. So as a woman, you are really inheriting that story of women who came before you. And I certainly would not be here without her and I didn't know that and that's so crazy like that's what's criminal is like I didn't understand the impact that she had made that would make way for me to to have a place to participate you know so she's like a mentor for Dizzy Gillespie so anyone who came into contact with Dizzy is going to feel that effect and so some of those people are people that I have played with, you know, that I know personally. Some of my friends knew Dizzy, like met him when they were babies, like, you know, so that, that we don't even know how that effect shows up. We can't even see some of those effects, but they're there. And they certainly, you know, the fact that she was such a well-known, well-respected musician, amongst musicians is super important because there have been many women in jazz that were important to the music and who achieved some acclaim. But I think she's the one that people undeniably respect in the musician world. And having a figure like that is so important. Um, I think every woman who came before me has had a harder time than me. And it's, I see even people I'm in my 30s. I see people in their 20s, young women, who are very successful already. And I'm like, wow, you had it so much easier than me, even though we're only, you know, five to 10 years apart. Um, so I can't even imagine that exponential difference of her generation, you know? And I see it with someone like Ingrid. I can see how much harder she had it than me, potentially. Um, and you see, see this in the numbers, too, that we are getting better. There are more young jazz musicians who are women now than there were when Ingrid was young, like 20s, you know. So um, all of this to say that lineage is very important and understanding the work that was done in terms of gender issues. And I think a lot of the way that it was handled in the past was either to ignore gender, like become one of the guys as an instrumentalist or become hyper objectified, sexualized as a vocalist. Um, and it's only in recent time, I think even in the last five years that I've seen a shift in both male and female in the jazz world being able to be less in those gender roles in terms of women having more ease not being hypersexualized or masculinized in order to fit into the jazz world um, 
And I think Mary Lou Williams somehow, her the image of her that I see is not hypersexualized or objectified, and it's not hyper masculinized. So I'm, I'm, that's very inspiring as well and interesting given the times. I think. I think one of the biggest obstacles as a woman in music, jazz specifically, composers specifically, but in general, is um, a lack of opportunity. And that comes from lower expectations. Um, so it shows up in a variety of ways. And specifically, you know, just getting less information like from your private teachers or from your band leaders, um, you know, your, your band directors or things like that. Um, going to camps and not getting the same information that your male peers are getting. Um, the lower expectations sometimes look like not receiving opportunities, like not getting first chair or not getting accepted into a program. But it could also be, um, it could show up the opposite. So it could be like you actually get in with less skill level. Um, and in the long run, that's hurtful because if you're getting that type of treatment as a student, you're not actually getting those musical tools that you need to get better at the same rate. Um, and then, you know, I think that one obstacle with the expectation is around society's gender stereotypes. Um, and this looks like socializing, like we socialize our girls and boys differently. So um, even having uh, encouragement to try different types of instruments, like saxophone, trombone, drum set, um, even trying different styles of music like jazz is typically a male dominated style. Um, and that type of encouragement or lack of encouragement might come from your parents or your friends, you know, your peer group or your teachers, depending on what type of, you know, community that you have. Um, and then as we get a little bit older, usually, um, it's these obstacles, I think, start to turn into more of a, um, I would say aggressive or violent type of thing. Maybe not so overtly for some people, but um, sexual harassment, sexual assault, sexual abuse. Um, and that can look like having to deal with bullying. It could look like having to deal with uh, being objectified, um, comments from your peers or your teachers, or um, as you move into the professional realm, um, not getting hired for things, or a band leader that hires you treating you this way. Um, it could look like the, the things we've seen in many colleges and any type of industry where there's a power issue with a, a person in position of power, um, taking advantage of that power and engaging in um, acts of sexual assault with younger people or people in a lower position of power, which typically in my world would mean a young woman. Um, so all of the things I'm mentioning, I have gone through personally. Um, I think that, you know, how have I gotten through it and overcome it, it has been, uh, I've been fortunate to have a very supportive family and parents that never kind of fell into those stereotypes. Um, they always, you know, set me up to believe I could do anything and kind of break stereotypes and encouraged me to be somebody challenging gender norms. Um, I think I had, I was fortunate to have certain mentors and teachers who were not this way and who were very positive and who encouraged me and um, I've had, I've been fortunate to have like friends and a peer group also who, um, it took me a really long time to find them like after college. <laughs> but once I did, um, that allowed me to also explore my own music like in my bands um, and you know, people, that's like my friends hiring me. And so having a community is really important to overcoming those obstacles in terms of uh, kind of like a support group, a network, and people that you can explore music with, like listen to music together, um, learn music together, practice music together, perform, all those types of 
elements of the music that are important in terms of succeeding, growing, establishing yourself. Um, the other thing that is can be an obstacle that I faced was not having any female mentors um, or people that I could see myself in that were doing it successfully. I will defer to my the mission statement for Weijo, um, which talks about um, trying to level the playing field in jazz so that women and non-binary musicians have an equal opportunity to participate and contribute to the art form. And basically what that means is in an ideal world for me, um, jazz is a place that looks like its population. So it's representative of the amazing diversity of the human race, um, whether that be gender, um, race, ethnicity, religion, you know, ability, um, age, any, you know, sexual preference, any, any type of thing that you identify as, we want the music to be something that everybody contributes to. That way the music grows to its fullest potential. Um, right now we know probably the biggest thing lacking is gender equality because if women are about 50% of the population and we only have one young woman at Rutgers, that's not even close to achieving representation of the diversity that exists in the world. So um, that would be my ultimate dream for jazz is that everybody is actually participating on a representative level. Throughout history, women identifying jazz musicians have faced countless challenges due to the patriarchal systems rooted in American history. Jazz, like other areas of music, is one of the careers believed to be unattainable for most women. Yet, female artists like Mary Lou Williams have blazed the trail for young women to walk the same paths that they did with increasingly fewer obstacles. While there is considerable work to be done in educating young musicians on these bold and powerful women and providing opportunities for all musicians, regardless of gender identity, to pursue their craft to the highest level, the future is still hopeful and those who follow in Williams' footsteps will continue to make the world of music a more equitable, diverse, and vibrant place.